My name is Barbara Emil, and I have just published my new book, Friends and Enemies, which is a memoir. Going back, I'm afraid, to the very early days of childhood, up until almost today, not quite. When I started the book, what I hoped to achieve, really, was just an understanding of myself, um, which sounds really terribly vain. But when you go through the sort of experience I've gone through, and people write things about you that, that are so at odds with how you see yourself. You, and when you reach the age I've reached, which is, I'm going to be 80 next birthday, you want to start seeing, what was I? What did I do wrong? What has happened? And I sat down to do that. And I suppose in a way, it was a little bit therapeutic. Uh, Conrad, my husband, was in prison. Um, when he came back, the, the bad times didn't go away. And so about three years ago, I'd started this book in 2005, but the years and the events were so horrible that I kept stopping, and I couldn't really focus on it until three years ago. It's a very dodgy time for print journalists. And, and when I was writing, um, it was pretty much a palmier time. You know, you could get decent salaries, you could get decent fees. I think now it's, it's tough. Um, in terms of good and bad writers, you know, it's funny, good writers always come, good things always get replaced in one way or another. We lost Mordecai Richler, who was a columnist with me, and I loved him. But I think that there are other columnists who have come up who are, are good. Um, in terms of the political bias, I think the cancel culture has made it as difficult, more difficult actually, for people to have certain views than they did in my time. In my time, I was just called a fascist bitch or unpopular or occasionally some human rights commission would investigate me and then go away when they discovered that I really didn't hate people. Um, and today I think you can't get away with that as mildly. You'll lose your job if you say the wrong thing. And so readers aren't really getting honest journalism. They're getting reflex journalism and received views. Nobody, people are frightened to speak out. I, I, I had, astonishingly, um, more success, I think, in, in the UK as a columnist than I did in Canada. I never won a prize in, in Canada, ever. Um, and I'd done thousands of columns. And in my first year there, I was runner up in the press awards to Bernard Levin, who was one of their greatest columnists. Um, I think that um, my columns didn't provoke more controversy than anyone who was writing from my point of view in Britain did. And in Britain, my point of view wasn't particularly new or novel. It was new in Canada, because in Canada, my point of view was not popular and rarely shared. But, you know, in, in, in Britain, you have 12 at the time, 12 daily papers, and you have extreme left-wing papers like The Guardian and The Independent. You have middle-of-the-road left like The Financial Times. And so papers like The Guardian absolutely hated me. And they hated a lot of people who wrote like me. Um, perhaps because I was a woman with these views, uh, although since I left, other women with these views have come up and they are dished just as badly as I was. Um, but perhaps because I was a woman and I, I didn't dress like a writer. Perhaps that, that was uh, an irritating factor. And I had learned in Canada something I didn't use as much in the US, in, in the UK, but I'd learned in Canada that if I wanted to get a reader to read my column, I had to start it off with a anecdote that would draw them in, would either shock them or draw them in, because I couldn't get them to read about the subjects I was writing about unless I could hook them like a fish, you know, on, on a hook. In England, I didn't have to do that as much because people there were interested in those views. But when I married Conrad, all of that changed. I went from one day to being a columnist that people 
dis whose views they disliked. And then the, the general drift of the people at The Guardian or wherever they didn't like me at The Independent was that I had now turned into a rich socialite. The fact was that I was still writing a column every week. I was doing the same amount of work. I was working just as hard, but I was now married to a proprietor of a newspaper, and that made me a different target. In today's political climate, um, there are a number of opinions that would make me lose my job on the spot. There would be protests. There, I don't think it actually would reach this level of protests. There'd be a couple of people in the newsroom that would get, you know, four more people around them and I'd be out the door. My first impressions of Conrad were perhaps not as flattering as he would like. I, I thought he was a, a stuffed shirt member of the Canadian establishment who wore pinstripe suits and went to um, Harry's or Winston's for lunch and uh, were all really rather boring. When I married Conrad, um, I moved into a different social sphere. Now, fortunately, Conrad really enjoys the company of historians and writers and intellectuals, so that was the saving grace. But he also enjoyed the company of high society, uh, which which includes some perfectly decent and clever people. Uh, if you're very high society in the UK, you probably can call up prime ministers of any European country and get the dope and lowdown on what's happening that ordinary journalists don't. Uh, you also have so much money that going to dinner with them at their lavish homes was absolutely terrifying. I mean, if you broke a plate, you know, you're talking about a $10,000 piece of China. Uh, and that, that was somewhat, um, somewhat surprising. It was different in going to society in America. Uh, their, their dinners were not as interesting because they didn't include people who were as linked in to politics as the UK mega millionaires. When I went to the wedding of Donald Trump, and gosh, now it seems such a significant thing. But at the time, to me, it was just a wedding that Conrad wanted to go to. And um, I didn't really think of it in any special way. I didn't get to see much of Donald because he was busy with his intimate circle of a thousand friends. Um, Melania was very gracious. She smiled and said hello. But the problem was that seated behind me was this extraordinary man. He was huge wearing very colorful clothing, and uh, I, I couldn't, he, he leaned over and said, hello, little lady. And from that point on, he cracked me up. It was Don King, a promoter of boxing matches, and I think a Las Vegas figure. And all through the ceremony, Don King, this huge man with this curly hair that stood up about a foot at that point. And these colorful clothings was absolutely cracking me up. And I was trying to be, of course, because it was a wedding serious. So Donald rather faded into the background next to him. I don't know if the seating was done deliberately, but I was very grateful for it. And Conrad and I were already facing difficulties, so we, we enjoyed just dancing under the skies. When the legal proceedings began against Conrad, the reaction of friends varied, but I'd say by and large all of them assumed he had done something wrong. Now, there are ways of, of saying it. You can say, oh, gosh, we all pad our expense accounts, uh, sort of trying to make it look smaller. And then there are the people who just, just cut you off their Christmas list, cut you off everything. Um, my close friends, and you don't really have many close friends in life. I had three or four in England, uh, remained absolutely staunch, just staunch. It was. It was me who withdrew. Um, I felt that I became a burden on them. They were always being called up by journalists, you know, to give an anecdote about me or, or tell some story about me. And that, that puts a strain on everything. If anyone actually asks me how fair the, I was treated by the media during this period, I can't really answer it without expiring on the spot. I mean, I have binders full of articles, thousands of them, uh, telling me how awful we are and not understanding the case at all. 
And I don't blame journalists. They're not specialists in, in corporate or financial law, but we got, a real, we got a real drilling from them. Since Conrad was pardoned, I don't think much is different except he can now travel to the United States. I think for Conrad, uh, people will always hold it against him in certain circles. For me, I never had much reputation to lose. Um, I continued to write till 2015 or 16. Um, people continued to read me. And I never had that sort of reputation to lose.